Welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday of Lent. We're so glad to have you joining us here at First Presbyterian Church in Helena, Montana. And we hope that you will enjoy this worship service and that it'll help bring you closer to God. So I ask you to take a moment here and prepare a worshipful space for wherever you are listening or viewing this. Bring in a Bible or a candle or maybe some coffee or tea, whatever it takes to create a special space, a worshipful space for you to where you can feel the presence of God with you. So let us now join into worship. Let's come with an opening prayer. And let us pray that as a flame streams upward towards heaven, so our longing th thoughts fly up to our God and Savior, who has truly wrought life from death and who has brought a fresh new world lovingly to us. And in his sweet chains caught us and made us free. Amen. And I hope you've had a chance to print off the bulletin or bring it up maybe on a tablet or your phone. Um, so I hope you have it with you so that you can join together in the call to worship and other readings that we do throughout the worship service. So let's come together in this call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those God redeemed from trouble. God gathers us from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Let us thank the Lord for God's steadfast love, for God's wonderful works to humankind. And Christ has lift up our brokenness so that we might see the wounds of the world. In the light of Christ, we can find healing and mercy. So let us confess our sin before our merciful and healing God. Let us join into the prayer of confession that's in the bulletin. O oh God, you have set before us our greed, our hatred, and our self-hatred, our fear, and our apathy. You have also shown us the injustice and tyrannies of our public life. We have succumbed to paralyzing anxiety in response to injustice. We have resisted the prompting of your spirit who nudges us out of self-absorption. Empower us by your spirit to be attentive and discerning partners in healing your creation. And now, a time for our silent confessions. God's healing mercy abounds. God's grace goes before us, after us, through us, sometimes even unbeknownst to us. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. We are forgiven and restored to right paths of justice and shalom. Thanks be to God.
and i hope you've had a chance to print off the bulletin or bring it up maybe on a tablet or your phone um, so i hope you have it with you so that you can join together in the call to worship and other readings that we do throughout the worship service so let's come together in this call to worship oh give thanks to the lord for god is good god's steadfast love endures forever let the redeemed of the lord say so those God redeemed from trouble. God gathers us from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Let us thank the Lord for God's steadfast love, for God's wonderful works to humankind. And Christ has lifted up our brokenness so that we might see the wounds of the world. In the light of Christ, we can find healing and mercy. So let us confess our sin before our merciful and healing God. Let us join into the prayer of confession that's in the bulletin. O oh God, you have set before us our greed, our hatred, and our self-hatred, our fear, and our apathy. You have also shown us the injustice and tyrannies of our public life. We have succumbed to paralyzing anxiety in response to injustice. We have resisted the prompting of your spirit who nudges us out of self-absorption. Empower us by your spirit to be attentive and discerning partners in healing your creation. And now, a time for our silent confessions. God's healing mercy abounds. God's grace goes before us, after us, through us, sometimes even unbeknownst to us. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. We are forgiven and restored to right paths of justice and shalom. Thanks be to God.
Please pray with me. Pour out your spirit to us to open our hearts so that we may discern your word in and through the words that we are about to hear. Show us your way in Christ. Amen. Our scripture lesson today is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our spiritual sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Our gospel reading today comes from John chapter 3, starting with the 14th verse. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be plainly seen that what he has done has been done through God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to tell a story, one I've told before, so you might have to indulge me if you've heard this before, but it fits so well with today's message, and I'm going to repeat it. I'm going to share it again. See, there was a family, and this is a true story, a family that they had one daughter, and she was three to four years old, and mother was expecting the second child. And she went to the hospital, and late one afternoon, delivered the second child, another daughter. And the following day, she spent the night there, and the following day, the husband and the older daughter were going to the hospital to pick up the mother and the newborn daughter. And as they got back into the car and on the way home, the older daughter made it clear that she wanted some time alone with her new sister. Now this raised a little bit of concern with the parents. They've heard about sibling rivalry and things like that, and they weren't sure exactly what to take, and it wasn't clear why the older daughter wanted some time alone with her younger sister. But they had bought one of those new fangled baby monitors that not only had the sound, but had the picture of what was going on in the room. And so they decided that this could be relatively safe, that if anything too untoward was coming down, they could go into the room and stop it. So they got home and they took the baby up to her room and laid her in her crib and explained to the older daughter to be careful with this newborn, that they're, that they're fragile and you needed to be nice and careful with this. And then they left the room and closed the door and quickly ran in their bedroom to see the other monitor, to watch what was happening. And they watched the older daughter, the four-year-old, walk over to the crib and ask the newborn, tell me about God, I'm forgetting. Are we closest in our life to God at our birth? 
Have we been in intimate communion with God during our gestation and maybe even before that? And do we know God so well? But then do we forget? As we learn the ways of the world, as Paul put it, do we forget about God? Do we forget about this relationship, this intimate relationship that we had? Do we lose sight of this? And do we need to ask again someone who's fresh from the womb to tell us about God? Now, many people think that some people come from good stock. You might hear this said. And by implication, there's others who come from less worthy stock, right? But Paul says that we are all garbage. None of us are from better stock than others because we have become agents of wrath by following the ways of this world. That we have followed the ways of the world, we've followed the ways of the kingdom of the air, as he says, and we are no longer in communion with God. But God, because of his great love for us, has made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions, when we were dead in our sin, that we have been saved by grace, not by works, as Paul says, so that we can't boast. So this is not something that we did, that we achieved on our own, that we got the salvation. No, this is a gift from God, a gift from love and compassion that has brought us out of our state of transgressions into the ways of Christ into the life of Christ. And there was a movie in 2004 called Wimbledon. It starred Paul Bettany and Kristen Dunst. And Paul Bettany was Peter Colt in this movie, an Englishman who was a professional tennis player. And at one point in time in his career, he had been ranked number 11. But here in his mid to late 30s, he's ranked 119. And he has gotten into Wimbledon on a wild card draw. Not because he had won some things that got him in there. Due to this wild card, he's in Wimbledon. And, and he shares with some people that we hear that he's decided that this is going to be his final tournament. He's going to retire after this tournament and hang it up. Because he feels that the young, up-and-coming tennis stars are fitter and faster than he is. And he just probably can't keep up. Now, Peter Colt has a younger brother, about 10 years younger. He's probably in his early 20s. And what we see in the movie when Peter Colt is going to his first match in Wimbledon, which he thoroughly expects to lose and be eliminated from the competition, that his younger brother is going into a shop and placing a bet against him. Now, the people in the store give him a little bit of hard time for betting against his very brother, but he's certain that Peter is going to lose. Except in the movie, he doesn't. And as the movie goes on and he gets to the second match, his younger brother goes again and bets against him. And Peter Colt wins that match too. And this ha keeps happening throughout the movie. Now, the crowd at Wimbledon is, shall we say, just a, a bit, a skosh more disciplined than the crowds at most American sporting events, particularly American football games. You know, as I understand it, the Seattle Stadium, the new one that they built recently, was designed specifically to make the crowd noise as loud as possible. But in Wimbledon, they get quiet before the serve. They stay quiet as the volley is taking back and forth. And when the point is finally won or lost, then there is a cheer or a sigh, depending upon who you're voting for or rooting for in this match. But they're very disciplined about this. They all turn off their cell phones before they get in there. But in American football games, it's quite opposite. We're very loud. And we hold up signs and we dress up funny. And one of the signs that you're likely to see in most every football games is someone will hold up a John 3.16 sign. A reminder that God first so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And as significant as this verse is, 
I personally find the next verse, 317, was more formative of my relationship with Christ. Because in 317, it tells us that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God nor Christ are a vengeful sort. Maybe we knew this when we were more intimately connected to God when we were born, but, but have forgotten since then. God and Christ aren't sitting around just waiting for us to mess up so they can flatten us with the holy fly swatter. No, they aren't banking on us failing. They aren't taking odds against us like Peter Colt's brother was doing in the movie Wimbledon. They aren't like the Greek and Roman gods, gods that at best tolerate humanity, and if we do anything that displeases them, are more than happy to hit us with a lightning bolt or some other way of letting us know of their displeasure. Christ and God aren't like maybe a teacher we had or a coach or a principal that was just waiting for us to mess up, to give us a detention or some other form of punishment that we got in school. God and Christ aren't like a boss who was constantly watching over us, just waiting to criticize us for not doing something as they desired or something that was wrong. No, God and Christ are for us, helping us rise above the transgressions and sin that Paul says that we've entered into, that Paul says that we were wallowing in before God's mercy made us alive again in Christ. Now, sometimes God and Christ may need to take some educational or correctional action with us from time to time, but it is done so in our best interest. It may be a little painful of what we're going through, but it's for our growth to go back into an intimate relationship with God who created us, for us to come back into being who God created us to be. And so we are saved by grace. We are saved by God's mercy. We are saved out of the love of God, wanting us to be as full and as live as fully as possible. But while we're saved by grace and not works, we're not supposed to be couch potatoes either. Paul goes on to, or goes on to say that we are God's workmanship, created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And I think that's key. Prepared in advance. Prepared in advance of our birth, in advance of our lives for us to do with the skills, clearly, that Christ bestowed upon us to do these works, these good works. All this before we were born, right? Right? So, let us remember, while we have forgotten God to be led by the rules of this world, while we've forgotten our intimate relation with them and made a closer relationship with the rules of this world, of the powers that be, of those things that tell us to seek our glory and not God's, that God has not let us realm in the kingdom of nothing, the kingdom of air. God has lifted us up from total depravity, as the theologian John Knox would say, to be alive in Christ. God and Christ are for us, leading us to true life, to life eternal. And so, if you have any questions, maybe go ask a newborn. Amen. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. God has given us many good gifts and calls us to respond. So now, let us give in return. Let us bring forward our tithes and our offerings. And we thank you again for your continued support of First Presbyterian Church and our missions and our ministries. Your continued giving helps us carry forward these through this time of pandemic and coronavirus. 
And you can send in your gift either by mail to First Presbyterian Church at 535 North Ewing Street in Helena, Montana, 59601. Or you can go to our webpage at fpchelena.org and on the home page there's a secure donate button that you can donate through. So now, let us offer, offer up a prayer of dedication for the gifts that we have bought to return to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, accept what we have to offer today in the hope that it reflects the offering of our lives as dedicated to you and your service. Bless all that we offer so that it might serve you in this church and in our world. Amen. And in the life of the church, we have two scholarships that are currently up for people who are attending college that are members of the church or related to a member of the church. One of these scholarships comes from Eve and Nelson Seeley, and it's administered through the Montana Community Foundation. And if you go on their website and look for the Seeley Family Memorial Scholarship, uh, you can fill out the application uh, to, to apply for this. And those who apply will be reviewed and selected by a panel here at the church. So this, once again, is for post-secondary school uh, things, college education. And the, there's several criteria for this. You can read on the website, you know, things like a minimum grade point average of 2.0 and a demonstrated financial need and demonstration of good character. So apply online for this by going to the Montana Community Foundation website at mtcf.org and create an account and fill out the application there on site. And we need to do so here because the deadline is coming up on April 2nd. So get at it if you want to apply for this one. If you have any questions, just call Lou Stark. He's the scholarship manager. She's, the, excuse me, Jenny Lou Clark. She's the scholarship manager at the Community Foundation, and her phone number is 441-4946. And the second scholarship is the Linton Scholarship that we administer here at the church. And we will be offering this scholarship, so look in the mustard seed for ways to fill out the application for this scholarship and, and once again apply for that. This one has a little bit longer deadline, so you don't have to, so if you're gonna apply for both, apply for the Sealy one first, okay? And now, let us offer our prayers of the people. Let us pray. O oh God of Lent, help us as we continue our journey to the cross and to the resurrection. Help us to discern the crosses that litter the landscape of our lives and your world. Enable us to see your resurrecting power always ready at work in the broken places of our lives and your world. Empower us to step into those places where we can participate in your work of bringing life out of death-tending places of our world. And we pray for the world of nations, especially for those places where violence is wrecking havoc upon human lives and the life of your creation. We pray for countries dealing with devastation caused by the pandemic. We pray for those in our own country who have lost jobs, revenue, health care, and loved ones during this relentless pandemic. And help us to serve as agents of your love and care to those who are suffering. And we praise for wise discernment by our nation's leadership as they negotiate ways in which to aid those most affected. Oh God, you have called us to be the church of Jesus Christ in this time and place. Keep us faithful to that calling. Help us to love one another and by so doing to be a witness to our world of what it means to be disciples of Jesus. In polarized communities, enable us to hear Jesus' commandment to love even those we perceive as enemies. Help us to refrain from seeing others as evil and ourselves as good. Empower us by your love to see each other as you, as your beloved. Enable us 
also to see that we are all sinners and saints who are equal recipients of your magnificent love. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So now that we've come together here to worship, it's time to go out into the world in peace of God in Christ. Love God with all your heart, strength, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Lift up the brokenhearted. Stand with the oppressed. And let all that you do be out of love. Amen.